Good evening, everyone. We are continuing on our study in the book of Hosea. Today, we are covering chapter 13. In chapter 13, it begins this way. When Ephraim spoke, uh, there was trembling, and he exalted himself in Israel. Through Baal, he did wrong and died. Now, one of our challenges in uh, in translation, is that it's not so easy to translate Hebrew into English. And well, chapter 13 has a couple of verses that we need to reconstruct again. Um, in chapter 13, verse 1, it says, when Ephraim spoke, um, the word here is when Ephraim spoke with trembling. Uh, and he became exalted. Uh, this word is not he exalted himself. Um, the word here is he became exalted. Became exalted in Israel. Now the word here is this. When, when Ephraim spoke, now we were talking about the northern nation, right? The northern nation. And the northern nation is known as Ephraim. However, Ephraim being the northern nation, it has a, a, a very long history. And it starts with Jeroboam. And now it is Jeroboam the second. At the time of Jeroboam, uh, he was well. The word trembling here is with with terror. He spoke very. Uh, how should we say? He he was speaking in, uh, in 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 trembling. Uh, in terror, in honor of Solomon at that point in time. And God exalted him to be king. Now, in the translation, we have to translate it into a more literal fashion in the Hebrew, from the Hebrew, so that we can actually see that this was a cause and then this is a reaction. And so the cause is number one. He was humble and he was, he was fearful of Solomon. And number two, God made him a king. So the idea of exaltation is lifted up in Israel. But through Baal, now the word here, through Baal, uh, it means um, he did wrong or he became guilty. The word wrong here is guilty. He became guilty by Baal. Uh, this would be idolatry, as you can tell. No, 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 nothing difficult here. And because he was no longer fearful of God, he was going to worship idols. And so the consequence is he died. So there is a cause and reaction. Uh, there is terror of God. He became king. Right? Um, let me just put it down here. He became king. And the second one is he was serving Baal. And God says, you will die. Now, again, we look at the character of God in these statements. God looks at the actions of Ephraim. Now, remember, Ephraim as a covering of the history of Ephraim. Uh, the various kings themselves uh, were fearful of God and in Jeroboam, but as they, they went on, they, they served idols. Jeroboam, 
in fact, was the first king who led the nation to serve idols because he was so afraid that his people from the north would go down to the south to Jerusalem and won't come home. And so he set golden calves in um, Bethel and in Dan. And that's the kind of connotation that you see that God says, when you do that, you die. Uh, that, that is probably something which we, we need to be aware that when they did well with God, God lifted them up. But when they turn away from God towards idols, God will decree for them to be ended. So the word die here uh, literally means uh, come to an end. And in so doing, Jeroboam had no um, dynasty. There was another one that became king. Verse 2. And now they sin more and more. Uh, they make for themselves uh, molten images. Idols skillfully made from their silver. All of them the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice hiss the calves. Um, we have a little problem with that last statement. We'll leave it. Uh, let's break down the first parts first. These are all easy. This is a, they increase in idolatry. I think that would be uh, an easy way of looking at things. Now, when he says they, they sin, Yes, the word is khatat, right? But in this case, in terms of sin, they are missing God even more. Uh, this has nothing to do with Leviticus chapters 1 to 7. This has to do with idolatry. And if you understand what is in Leviticus chapter 1 to 7, it has nothing to do with idolatry. The sins that they were atoning for were sins that were committed unintentionally, that they had offended God by not complying completely to the rituals and the demands of the rituals of the tabernacle and the temple. And that can be atoned. However, as we enter into this book of Hosea, two things that has come up yesterday and uh, the previous weeks is idolatry and injustice. And this is called Hamas. Now, we are now talking about idolatry here. And idolatry has no atonement. Uh, you can search the whole Bible over and you will never see a prescription for an atonement so that they can be forgiven. Uh, same thing with injustice. And so throughout the book of Hosea until today, you would find that God is bringing this charge against them and calling them to repent. Only if they repent that God will relent on the judgment and and in this case you are you you should know by now that the warnings has been given to Ephraim is an impending doom by a northern nation called Assyria and so they have increased in idolatry and this verse here let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves I think we can we, we will need to retranslate this it says, let me use a different color. It says, um, those who sacrifice men then kiss the calves. Now, this is a slight difference in the translation, and this would be a better way of translating it, in fact. Um, it says this, those who sacrifice men. 
And God hates human sacrifices. And it's brought up here because God is trying to point out to them what God is completely finding it abominable, disgusting. And the people there in their idolatry say, well, go kiss the calves. Now, the word kiss uh, is not our modern day kiss, unfortunately. It literally means um, put put lips to calves. Yeah, that, that would be a better way of translating it. Put your lips to the calves. And these would be the golden calves. There are two golden calves that Jeroboam set up, one in Bethel and one in Dan. And it has become a big thing in the northern nation. In, in, in fact, it would be something uh, along the lines of Molech, where they offer uh, babies and, and virgins and um, men sacrificing humans, so to speak. Now, in verse 3, we read this. Therefore, the word therefore, every time you read therefore, it is a consequence of the first two verses. Therefore, what are their consequences? We're talking about the consequences. See, God is bringing a charge against them, and there are consequences of an intense idolatry. Therefore, they will be like the morning cloud, like dew which soon disappears, like chaff which is blown away from the threshing floor, like smoke from a chimney. Now, you must say that this would be an A, a B, a C, and a D. All four is talking about a transient, And then disappear. It appears for a short while and it disappears. Which means this. That the, 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 the people in Israel. right? The people in Israel. These people, they. The ones in Ephraim who makes idols. They worship idols. They encourage idolatry. They are going to be like the morning cloud. Uh, that are uh, like dew. Like morning cloud, like dew, like chaff, like smoke from a chimney. Basically, they are there for a short while and they will disappear. They will be no more. That will be verse 3. Verse 4. Now, God looks back and reminds them who he is. Oftentimes, you read in the Bible, remember the Lord, remember the Lord. The word remember literally means to bring back, uh, to recall right? your memories, right? Recall what has happened in the past. And so God is now recalling. He says, yet I have been the Lord, your God. This word is Jehovah, your God. Whenever it says your God, means God is still in relationship with them. Since the land of Egypt, you were not to know any God except me. Now, this is a very important, um, I guess you've, you find this as part of Exodus chapter 20. Right, Exodus chapter 20. 20 verse 3. You shall not have any gods before me. You are not to know. The word know is to experience any other, uh, well, it says any other God, uh, any other Elohim. Except God Elohim. For there is no Savior besides me. This is a very important aspect to remind Israel. The word Savior uh, literally means anyone who would be of 
help. There's no one to deliver. And the idea of savior in the case of the Hebrew people is really somebody who would liberate them from the enemies. There is no one besides me. And so the idea here is God must be seen as savior. God is the only God or only Elohim, only mighty one. And, and this would be Jehovah God, Jehovah your God. And so understanding verse 4 is really trying to remind them, how did you get out of Egypt? I was there. I brought you out with a mighty hand. You are not to go after any other gods. You are not to experience anybody else, any other gods besides me. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. Jehovah, God, is the only God. There is no savior besides me. What do you mean no savior? There's no one that can deliver you out of Egypt. There's no one to deliver you out of the hands of your opponents and enemies except for Elohim, except for God. Why? Because he is the one true God that when the people around them, the nations around them see Israel uh, obeying God, they will tremble because God is the true and mighty God. And we read that in the book of Deuteronomy. And so this is a reminder to Ephraim what has happened in the distant past. Why is it that you have forgotten? Verse 5. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. The idea here is this word. You're not to know any other gods. And this what I care is I know. I have been acquainted. It is not a word care in terms of uh, caring for each other. I know you in the desert. In the land of drought. What do you mean drought? Means there is no water. Where were they? They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Now for a long time, I think when we read the episodes in the book of Deuteronomy, many of us may not have the appreciation of how tough that journey was. And when they had no water, they were taken care of by God. And water came out from the rock to feed about a million, two million people with animals. There was a lot of water that came out of a couple of rocks uh, that Moses were told, uh, one to strike and the other one to speak to. And lots of water came out. And so God knew their behavior. Verse 6. As they had pasture, meaning when they were grazing, right? When they were grazing, this is the word. When they were grazing, they became satisfied. They are full. And being satisfied, they became proud, right? And the idea of proud is high uh, high in heart. It's a very visual uh, uh, word. They became proud. They, their heart was lifted up. And so after they were satisfied, their heart was lifted up. And what happened? Therefore, they forgot me. The word forgot literally means to 
Well, I guess cease to care, I think would be a good word. Cease to care. Uh, they they, they kind of forgot what who God was. Uh, they kind of ignored, I think this would be a good word to use, ignored God. So this is this word here, forget. So next time when you read the Bible and you talk about no anyone forgetting God, it is not so much as you forgot your answers in your exams. It literally means you they really didn't care who God was anymore after they were satisfied. They had the water, they had the quail, they had the mana, uh, and, 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 and they couldn't be bothered with God. And that was the kind of people Israel was. And so God called them stiff-necked, very much like the Oriental thinking, the, the neck is hard, and, and, and they find it very hard to, to soften up themselves to obey God. And so God tells them this. So, verse 7, and so I will, I, God, right, this is God, will be like a lion to them. What do you mean a lion? Now, this word lion is not a big lion. This is a, um, I guess you can say a, a young lion, perhaps. Uh, a roaring lion, right? A young lion. A roaring lion to them. Like a, Leopard, I will lie in wait by the wayside. This is about lurking. Waiting for them. So this is an imagery of two wild animals. Uh, I think let's look at the next verse to complete this. I will encounter them like a bear robbed of her cubs. A bear, a lion, a leopard, very angry. I will tear open their chests. I will also devour them like a lioness as a wild beast would tear them. Now, I think you can see the imagery. This is the imagery of wild animals. Of angry animals. Right? And the intent here is to devour uh, to tear, to rip apart. And, and all of these is showing an imagery of God's attitude towards Ephraim. Very seldom does God actually use such vivid imagery? This vivid imagery is to show how angry God is. And, and in the imagery, it is God is equating himself uh, as a lion, as a leopard, as a bear, as a lioness. All of these gives an imagery that God is going to be unperturbed. God is going to just completely destroy the nation. That is the imagery right now. And, and is that what God is doing in verse 9? So let's look at verse 9. Verse 9 says this. It says, you, it's your destruction, O Israel, that you are against me, against your help. Uh, we will need a little bit of retranslating again. It says, you have destroyed yourself. Right? You have destroyed yourself, O Israel. And it says, you have, you have rebelled against me, uh, against your help. 
And so the word me and help are hand in hand. What is help? Uh, help would be one who provides aid. All right? One who comes to the help of another. Uh, one who, yeah, one who gives help. And this is God is the one whom you call on when you need help. But as wild animals, God is portraying himself that he is coming no longer to help because they have rebelled against God. This is important. Uh, this word here, against me, literally means a sense of rebellion against God. And it is your destruction or you have destroyed yourself. And this is the, the conclusion, the, the result of the imagery of wild beasts. This is about the destruction of Israel. Now, by Israel, again, I would point out and I'll try to do that every now and then. This is the northern nation, Ephraim. Next verse, verse 10. says, Where now is your king that he may save you in all your cities and your judges of whom you requested? Give me a king and princess. Uh, again, we have a bit of a challenge in the translation, but generally it's fine. Where is your king? That he may save you. And this is the trust in kings. And in your judges, whom you say, give me a king, a leader or leaders to rescue. And this, this word here is uh, to save is to deliver. To rescue. And so the leaders are supposed to do that. Now this word here, it, instead of where now is your king, uh, it may be better to, to translate this way. I am or I will be that God is there. But where is your king? Now, that would be the, the few words that is not translated. It says, God is saying, I am here. I will be here as well. And you know, the name of God, Jehovah, means uh, who was, who is, and is to come. And God is declaring, I am here. I am, I can be your help, but I don't want to. Uh, you are depending on other people for your help. Call your king. Where is he to save you? Call your judges who, have, who are appointing leaders. Where, what happened to your leaders? Verse 11. I gave you a king in my anger. I took him away in my wrath. Uh, this is important. Uh, this is to show that when God was there to give them a king, I think you can look at the illustration of King Saul. When the people wanted to have a king, God gave them a king, right? He is the first king. He didn't last long in the ple pleasure of God. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 13, and 1 Samuel chapter 15, this became the end of Saul. Or end of Saul in the eyes of God. And God did not have mercy on Saul. No mercy. God did not allow Saul any chance to recover. Because he would not in the first place. And so in the Davidic covenant, 
if you go back and read Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David that he will have mercy on his children. Not like when he removed mercy from Saul. So this is about God getting angry and God ripped off the throne and cancelled his dynasty from the throne of Israel. That is what God's wrath is all about. I give you and I can take it away. And it is in God's power to award and God's power to remove. And so that would be the picture, I would say, uh, in verse 11. Verse 12, it says here that the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is stored up. Now, there is some Im important elements here that we must be aware of. The iniquity of Ephraim, the iniquity here is the Avon, the perversion of Ephraim. He says, is bound up. Right? It, it's, a, it's a good word. It's bound up. And the word bound up means it is tied up. Tied up. Now, what does that mean? Tied up literally means to, uh, well, if you have, uh, let's see, if you have, the, the, the straws, right? The straws. And then you have the heads. And so what you do is that when you bind them up, it is now, this is the concept of bind up, right? This is the concept of bound up. The concept here is now is kept together. That is the picture that is, is being portrayed. Uh, this word sin, right, is khatat. And it says it's stored up. The word stored up here is like, uh, how should we say? It is reserved. It is hoarded. Uh, how should we, how else will you say? Um, it is set aside or laid away. Uh, kept aside. Now, these are all very good words to use for the word stored up and the word bound up. And this is, uh, if you, are not aware by now, this would be an A and a B. This is a picture of God keeping score with Ephraim. That all the sins and guilt and perversion, the Avon and the Hatat, is set aside for judgment, right? That's the picture for judgment. Let us now wrap up the rest of the three verses. Verse 13, the pains of childbirth come upon him. He is not a wise son. For it is not the time that he should delay at the opening of the womb. Now, what does that mean? It, it means that the, the pangs of a woman, the pains of childbirth is a woman in labor. Right? It is going to come upon him. He is not a wise son. In other words, we can write this this way. He is an unwise son. For it is a time for, it's not the time that he should delay the opening of the womb. 
Uh, it literally means that he should not stand in the birth stool of children. Now, there is a word here. Uh, he should not delay at the opening of the womb. It's actually translated this way. Um, that he shall not stand uh, this word is in the breaching of the womb. Now, this is a very graphical imagery uh, of what is coming upon Ephraim. And the picture that is being communicated here is that the judgment that's coming upon Ephraim is like a woman in labor. And, uh, and Ephraim doesn't even know how, what is going to happen at the time of labor. And he is trying to stop the labor. And, uh, and he's not, he should not stand at the breaching of the womb. So he should not stand uh, in front of a woman who is about to give birth. And once the, uh, the woman gives birth, uh, nothing will stop it from happening. And that's the picture that verse 13 is giving with regards to the impending judgment of God like a woman in labor about to give birth to a child as the womb is about to break forth and the water back bursts. Now, verse 14 would be rhetorical questions that God is making. And so he says, Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? Um, a little comment here first. Now notice, there's a word, them. Uh, and this word here, um, actually has another, uh, it refers to, a word that is not translated in verse 13. He shall not stand in the breaching of the womb. And there are, there is another word uh, of sons that comes at the back of this line, right? Right here. Uh, so unfortunately, in our English, we're, we're not completely um, translating it, but it's important that you know that it's there of sons, and this is being plural. Uh, and it refers very much to this word, them. Uh, because in Hebrew, uh, all the pronouns uh, must align themselves so that you can tell what is speaking about what, who is speaking to who, uh, what is the, or the speaker referring to. And so God says, shall I ransom them? First of all, the word ransom means to, uh, to release them, to bring back. So let me just use these concepts here. Ransom. It is to uh, bring back to the original, right? To the original state. Uh, shall I redeem them? And the word redeem them is a very similar word. It is to return to rightful original owner. And so these two words are very similar in meaning. And so we have an A and a B. 
And so what does it mean now? Now that you can put it together, it literally means this. Shall I bring them back from the power of Sheol? Meaning they are about to die. Should I bring them back to the state of not dying? And the second one says this. Shall I redeem them from death? Shall I return them back to the rightful owner? Not death, but life. And meaning there is this impending judgment that's coming upon Ephraim and nothing is about to stop this from happening. And God is now making a rhetorical statement. Am I going to stop it? Am I going to reverse it? And so he makes this comment here. O death, where are your thorns? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion will be hidden from my sight. These are very serious words. It says, O death. So notice this word here. Um, In verse 14, when he says, O death, where are your thorns? Right? Where are your, uh, your, 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 well, I guess it, it talks about, uh, uh, where is your sting? Right? Uh, your, your ability to destroy. And so, in verse 14, there is some challenge in the translation as well. And so this is what you can actually translate this. This, uh, O death, oh, I will be your words of death. I will decree the grave upon you. And so the, the idea of sting, right? the idea of sting, and thorns, and this is, these two words are about destruction. It says about death, about Sheol, an alternative translation looks something like this. Let me give you this. It says, I will be your words. Of death, and I will be, I will decree the grave upon you. And so, this, these are the Hebrew contemporary understanding. Instead of, oh, death, where are your thorns? Oh, Sheol, where is your sting? Basically, it is about death, death and grave, or the Sheol, the underworld, right? The afterlife below the, the ground. And so God is saying, I am confirming, I am confirming death and grave upon Ephraim. That is the general meaning here. Uh, it is not about a challenge to death or Sheol. Right? It's not a question to them because um, the English seems to say, oh death, where are your thorns? Oh Sheol, where is your sting? As if it was a, a, a personification that God is speaking to them. Uh, in actual fact, this would become a phrase that says, uh, with regards to death, it will happen. With regards to Sheol, it will definitely be taking place. And the last line here is compassion. Compassion is hen. Now, compassion uh, the, uh, the word compassion here uh, is nocham, or from the word nacham, this is about, how should we say? 
This word comes from the word repent. Right? Repent. Or relent. Or change heart. Now let me explain this. We read of this word first in Genesis chapter 6. When God was to destroy the world. And God Naham, uh, God relented from wanting to make man because they have gone to such a bad state. And here, God says, um, I am not going to repent. I'm not going to relent. I'm not going to change my heart. Uh, even more important, I have no remorse. I think that would be a good word. I have no remorse. And, and basically, what is God saying? God is saying that it, it is going to come. It's going to be like a woman labor. You're not going to stop it. And I, God, is not going to stop it. And it is, it's in such poetic language. Right? It's in such poetic language. So let's complete the last verse in verse 15, and then we'll end for the day. Verse 15 says this, Though he flourishes among the reeds, an east wind will come, the wind of the Lord coming from the wilderness. His fountain will become dry. His spring will be dried up. It will plunder his treasury of every article. Now, this part here, right above the first few lines talks about his state that he seems to be flourishing among the reeds, among the, the bushes in the, the marshes, right? Uh, and Ephraim is portrayed that, oh, it seems to be growing well. And God says, an east wind will come. It is called the wind of the Lord that will come from the desert. Now, yesterday I have described to you that the east wind, when it blows from the Jordan towards the Israel, you find that everything dries up. It is so dry that it will practically break your skin. And so the picture of the east wind is one of destruction. The fountain will become dry. The spring will be dried up. And so the intent to show is that this wind, when it comes, will plunder the treasury of every precious article. And is speaking about the impending judgment with the Assyrians. They will come and they will come to remove all their booty. That is, whatever is worthwhile, whatever is desirable, whatever is precious will all be gone. And this essentially is a conclusion of chapter 13 to show how angry God is and he's not about to pull the brakes on Ephraim, on the house of Israel, on Samaria. And with this, we come to the end of our session today of chapter 13.